Good morning, everybody. I'm Rebecca Santamaria Fernandez, Director of Industry Partnerships and Commercialization Engineering at Imperial Enterprise. And I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Imperial Tech Pitch event, focusing on affordable technologies for an aging society. With this event, which we're delivering together with Imperial Business Partners, we're hoping to bring some of the amazing work that goes on at Imperial directly to your home offices or your workplaces. At Imperial, our mission is not just to understand the world, but to have an impact on it and to change it for the better. Imperial's enterprise helps transforming research and ideas into benefits for society. And we do this by supporting Imperial staff and students on their enterprising journeys and connecting them to businesses like yours. We are passionate about developing and bringing Imperial's academic discoveries to society. And impact is really at the heart of what we do. I really hope that today we can give you a snapshot of Imperial's engineering research and technologies that will enable a better and healthier quality of life, providing scalable, affordable, personalized and less invasive solutions to our aging society. This is a challenge that we cannot face alone and we need you and your organizations to help us make a difference. Right after this, you'll meet my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Jeffers, who leads Imperial's Biomechanics Research Group and has an active role in our enterprising ecosystem at Imperial. He'll be telling you a bit more about our efforts to tackle this challenge. Then you'll also get to meet our researchers and you hear about their work and technologies developed by the research groups. During the event, we might be running a couple of polls to get your immediate feedback on the topics presented, which may inform the discussion in the Q&A to be chaired by Jonathan later on. So please do join in. And also you can submit your questions or comments in the chat so that we can pick this up during the Q&A too. After the event, our team will be more than happy to follow up with you to help you get access to our researchers or get more information about their work and see how it might be relevant to you and your organization. Contact details are in the event page and in the chat. Please do enjoy the event and I'll now hand over to Jonathan. Thank you, Rebecca, and good morning, everyone. I'm Jonathan Jeffers, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Imperial College, and I've been working in the industry and academic side of the orthopaedic sector for the past 16 years. Today, there are four people of working age to support every single person on a state pension. But in 20 years from now, there will be three people of working age to support every pensioner. This die is cast, and it's up to us to tackle the challenge of providing improved healthcare for the aging population in a more affordable way. At Imperial, a key priority for us is impact, and we work with industry and government stakeholders to ensure our research is informed and can be translated to effective solutions for industry. Today, you will hear some of the fascinating and crucially important research and technology being developed at Imperial that enables us to meet the challenge of the aging population by providing treatment that is more affordable, scalable, personalized, and less invasive. We will discuss rapid manufacture for personalized and affordable medicine, neurotechnology for motor rehabilitation, new treatments for wound healing, the next generation of orthopedic surgery, as well as platform technologies for cardiovascular disease, which particularly affect the aging population. I'm really looking forward to hosting a live Q&A after the talks, so please do use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to post questions. Now, it's time for our first talk. Hi, I'm Dr. Richard Van Arkel. I'm a lecturer here in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. I'm gonna share with you the work we're doing to optimize and preclinically test the next generation of orthopedic implants. To put this into context, I'm going to discuss knee disease in the UK. 
But this slide could read hip disease, it could read spine disease, it could be for any country with an ageing population. One in five over the age of 45 have sought treatment for knee osteoarthritis, but there's currently no cure. Instead, 100,000 people every year are having their complete joint replaced with an engineered alternative. The direct cost of this is huge, demand is increasing, and healthcare providers are already struggling to keep up. One in four people awaiting a joint replacement are medically defined as being in a state worse than death. But even in the context of this, 10 to 20% are dissatisfied postoperatively. This could be joint stiffness, it could be due to functional impairments such as inability to get out of a chair or instability giving them a fear of falling. Either way, there's a lot that can be improved to both reduce the cost of healthcare, improve efficiency and improve outcomes for patients. Here in the biomechanics group, we model orthopaedic surgery in the laboratory, whether that's an early intervention to stop osteoarthritis taking hold, or the latest generation of arthroplasty implants aimed at overcoming those functional limitations associated with the poor outcomes postoperatively. We work with industry and we work with surgeons to model what's going on in the clinic in as close a scenario as possible in the lab to optimise the joint biomechanics. We have a very productive relationship working with industry. These are the publications we've made with industry in the past two years from our group. And that list grows if we include clinical centres of excellence from around the world. There's a lot of overlap between the surgeon work and the work with industry because both are key to the success of our research in our group. We achieve this with unique research capability. Whether they're custom rigs designed for a specific purpose, such as this hip rig designed to study impaction in arthroplasty, or this knee rig designed to simulate the way the knee extends with physiological muscle loading. We also have two robots that allow us to apply known forces and torques in all six degree of freedoms. We have a low force one and we have a high force one and capable of applying over a kilonewton of load, really allowing us to simulate daily activities in the lab. We have a fluoroscopy system that allows us to check the position of our implants when we're simulating surgery in the lab and it allows us to look inside the joints as we test them in our robotic system. We're also investing research into new ultrasonic methods that will allow us to measure tissue properties in vivo and allow us to measure strains in vivo to correlate with our lab data to fill that void between surgical simulations and what happens with patients postoperative. We also have an ISO 13485 quality management system certified additive manufacturing laboratory where we can make titanium additive manufactured lattices. And we can test these in new living bone models. We have the method to keep bone, bone samples viable, whether they're from the food chain or surgery. We give cells the nutrients they leave and we can measure bone adaptation in the lab for the first time. It's more efficient than animal models and it's more efficient and safer than a clinical trial for many new innovations. The impact we deliver for our industry partners are reduced risk for clinical trial, optimised function and new insight and understanding. For the ageing population, we're delivering safer surgery, improved outcomes and lifelong mobility. So to summarise, in the biomechanics group, we model orthopaedic surgery and joint function. We do real implantations real joints and the real loads to get as close to surgery and post-op function as possible in the lab. And for us, stakeholder involvement is key, whether that's working with industry partners or getting surgeons in the lab to get their hands on, it's essential to drive our research forwards. Thank you to my active research funders and thank you very much for listening. I'm Cleo Contoravi and I'm a reader in Biosystems Engineering at the Department of Chemical Engineering and also a member of Imperial's Future Vaccine Manufacturing Research Hub. I will talk to you today about the rapid delivery of vaccines and personalized medicines. In today's aging society, our goal is to achieve lifelong health. And to do this, we can have pharmacological interventions that either prevent or treat disease. Prevention can be achieved, for example, through the use of vaccines, while treatment can be affected through the use of small molecule drugs, macromolecular therapies such as molecular antibodies, or nucleic acid therapeutics. Of course, drug efficacy varies between patients, and therefore we have a need for personalization, but we need to achieve this 
while maintaining or even increasing affordability and delivering these tailored medicines in a timely fashion. We propose a paradigm shift in how new drugs are being made. We suggest that cell-free platform technologies have the capacity to significantly accelerate both development and manufacturing. We can use these technologies to produce RNA vaccines, but also protein-based therapeutics. Our vision is to go from a development and manufacturing timeline of about 10 years to a contracted time scale of about two years. The advantages of these platforms are that they are agnostic to the product and therefore they can be pre-qualified for gaining accelerated approval. In our group and in collaboration with us of Dr. Karen Polizzi, we have developed a cell-free protein synthesis platform that relies on mammalian cells. It starts with components that are completely agnostic to the product, such as the cell lysate that has been extracted from Chinese hamster ovary cells, amino acids and energy sources. And then the system, which is open and controlled and therefore easier to optimize, is supplemented with a DNA template that it codes for our product of interest. Because we are using mammalian cells, we can achieve the necessary post-translation modifications that are required for higher stability and efficacy. We have used this system to produce monoclonal antibodies, including two products from an industrial collaborator that are known to be difficult to express in cells. Our yields are comparable to commercial systems for cell-free protein synthesis using mammalian cells, and we are working on increasing these to make them competitive against industrial systems for cell-based production. We have an extra, uh, an extra part to this in vitro protein synthesis platform, which deals specifically with modification. We have tried to tackle the challenge of heterogeneity that uh, stems from glycosylation. This is a post-translational modification that gives rise to a great deal of structural heterogeneity of our product that affects both stability but also in vivo efficacy. To tackle this, we have come up with a modular design for the enzymatic modification of these uh, sugars attached to the protein backbone in vitro that is um, highly segregated and deals with the issue of enzyme promiscuity, therefore achieving over 90% structural homogeneity. It also gives us the opportunity to personalize this, the sugar profile and tailor it to the needs of a particular patient. Overall, the key strengths of the cell-free platforms we have been developing is that they are suitable for point-of-care production and that the protein structure can be personalized to suit the needs of an individual or a cohort of patients. It, th these systems offer considerably faster production times than cell-based uh, platforms and can receive pre-qualification, accelerating development of new products. Finally, we have developed a range of tools for the model-based design of new processes using cell-free platforms that can support development, optimization, but also technology transfer and scale up or scale out. Good morning. My name is Dario Farina. I'm a professor of the Department of Bioengineering of Imperial College. And today I have the pleasure to share with you our results and vision on neural interfacing technologies. The aging of the world population has determined a large increase in age-related health issues, which are both physical and cognitive. We can partly counteract these impairments by assistive technologies, such as exoskeletons, exosuits, therapeutic robots, and virtual reality. These technologies often require, or at least would benefit, from a direct connection with the nervous system of the patients. Connecting with the nervous system can be achieved by recording from the brain, spinal cord, or peripheral nerves. This is often done by invasive technologies, which means implanting devices into the target neural structures. However, it is clear that the neurosurgery needed for the implant cannot be accepted in a large number of clinical cases. Implanted technology is used because it allows us to get close to individual neural cells and therefore to identify their activity. 
or whether this is at least in principle possible also with non-invasive technology, since the electric fields produced by the neural cells can be detected on the body surface. We have dedicated the past 20 years of research to develop methods that allow identifying the activity of single neural cells from electrodes placed on the skin surface. We have solved this problem for neural cells in the spinal cord, for which we can detect signatures on the body surface and therefore decode the neural code. These approaches allow to use wearable systems such as sleeves that can be mounted in seconds and without surgery. As an example of application of this technology, we have recently detected the neural activity below the spinal lesion in spinal cord injury patients by using a wearable system. With this approach, we can, for example, control an exoskeleton that would allow to regain the end movements in these patients. Similarly, we apply these approaches in early phases of stroke rehabilitation, when there is no clinically detectable movement. In these conditions, we are still able to decode neural activity in the spinal cord and connect it to virtual reality or other therapeutic technologies. Of course, since we do not require any surgery, we are not limited by clinical cases. We can use these approaches in healthy individuals as well for redefining our interaction with technologies, as we are doing in collaboration with Facebook Reality Labs. To conclude, we believe that non-invasiveness is a crucial feature of future neural interfaces. The capacity of assessing individual neural cells non-invasively will substantially widen the application potential on neural interfaces in clinical applications and beyond. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Richard, Cleo and Dario for the great contributions. I'm Francesca Pietra and I'm part of the Industry Partnership and Commercialization team at Imperial. Our team facilitates interaction between academia and industry, supports the development of research collaboration with industrial partners and the commercialization of Imperial technologies. I truly hope you are enjoying the event today. And if you want to know more about what was discussed and you are interested in engaging with our academics and our team, please get in touch after the event. We will be very happy to arrange a follow-up meeting to discuss in more details how we can work together. All the contact details are in the event page and in the chat, so please have a look. We will not have time for a question right now, but we will ask you to fill in a quick pool instead to get your initial feedback on the topic discussed up to now. And there will also be a similar one at the end of the next series of talks. This would be very useful to inform the Q&A session later on. Also, please keep using the chat function and post your question and comments, and they will be picked up during the Q&A session with Dr. John John Jeffers. And now let's move to the second part of the event, where we're gonna hear from our inventors about the amazing technology they're working on. I really hope you enjoy it and thank you very much. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Mansin Tang. I'm a professor of biomedical imaging here at Imperial College. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about using ultrasound for functional imaging. Right. So here there are some gaps in clinical imaging, for example, uh, in monitoring cancer therapy or detect metastasis in lymph nodes or in cardiovascular disease to look at the plaques. Currently really the only um, the key imaging marker is about geometry, is about the size of the cancer or the lymph nodes, etc. So this geometric information is really uh, it's easier to obtain, but the not optimal. And we know that blood flow, uh, the fundamental to tissue function, uh, but they're generally more difficult. So, uh, so if you look at this imaging here, this is a cancer, this is a tumor, where uh, you, you look at the uh, traditional kind of image, lo uh, looking at the structure. But if you look at the microvascular flow of the exactly the same cancer, you can see uh, a huge amount of detail, new information uh, about this cancer uh, that uh, is not available just for uh, if you look at the size of the 
uh, or geometry of the tumor. So we have developed a range of technology to look at blood flow imaging. Uh, for example, in the large cavity or large vessel, here you're looking at the, the flow in the heart where you, you see lots of like these details of the flow. You can also quantify them. This is a, a, uh, a model of the um, uh, bulbification, uh, of the carotid bulbification uh, and the blood flow in them. You can quantify this flow and color code them. And this is a, another a technology we developed where we just use the simple existing kind of 2D imaging probe where we can actually uh, image the 3D velocity flow vectors uh, um, in real time. Um, so um, we have uh, also developed uh, in parallel a number of technologies to look at microvascular flow. So you're looking at on the left, a 3D scanning of a mouse liver. And then the second one here is the movie showing the flow dynamics, the microvascular flow dynamics in a rabbit kidney where the vessels are about 100 microns or less. And uh, the last three image, if you see in here, you're looking at a lymph node, the traditional structure imaging, but if you look at the microvascular information, we can obtain here the smallest vessel we're looking at is about, it's less than 30 microns. So this is a specific clinical challenge. And so every year, uh, we have 46 people with invasive breast cancer in the UK alone, uh, and only a third, less than a third of them have metastasis in their armpit lymph nodes. Uh, but currently there's no technology that can detect this metastasis uh, uh, in the lymph nodes non-invasively. Um, so uh, the surgeon has to um, take them out. So every year, roughly 32 patients 32,000 patients are subject to unnecessary armpit surgery to find out whether they have metastasis in their lymph nodes. This causes huge harm to patients, uh, uh, life-changing side effects, and uh, a huge amount of cost to NHS. Uh, so here, uh, for our technology, unique selling points are the non-invasive and functional imaging tool, uh, enabled by the superb resolution and sensitivity to microvascular flow. They fit into the clinical work very well because ultrasound is already used to, to image this uh, uh, lymph node as a clinical uh, uh, patient pathway. And uh, of course, ultrasound accessible and affordable. So there are a range of clinical applications. This is a platform technology, and there's a range of clinical applications associated with aging population, like the cancer, cardiovascular disease. And currently, uh, we have developed a research prototype. We have demonstrated this uh, principle in, in vivo. We're doing a number of clinical trials in cancer, cardiovascular disease, and uh, we're hoping to integrate the technology to the existing top and ultrasound uh, system. So I will stop here. It is estimated that one third of the total disabilities in the world is caused by neurological conditions. Examples are spinal cord injury, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and epilepsy. Although drugs have shown to be helpful in many cases, developing pharmaceuticals is becoming more expensive and less efficient. Fortunately, solutions based on implantable medical devices exist. However, they are often built with decade-old electronics, housed in bulk invasive units that connect to a small number of implanted electrodes. Hi. My name is Dorian, and today I'm going to talk to you about MINT. MINT is a project that aims at making next-generation implantable neuro technologies less invasive and more accessible to people suffering from neurological conditions. I am an electronic engineer and researcher from Imperial College London, working on microelectronics for neural interfaces and medical technologies. I am part of the Next Generation Neural Interfaces Lab, where we create novel neural technologies to enable communication between the nervous system and electronic devices. 
The solution I'm proposing with Mint is based on an innovative approach to both monitor and treat neurological conditions. We are creating a distributed network of miniaturized, freely floating medical implants. Each implant is fully wireless and capable of electrically interfacing with the nervous system, thanks to the presence of microchips and microantennas. This fundamental change in the neural interfacing concept is a paradigm shift from past approaches in the medical devices industry, and it's made possible by leveraging advanced microsystems and integrated circuit technologies. Our bread and butter. Making implants so small will allow in future for them to be injectable without the need for any major surgery. Moreover, it empowers a distributed approach with multiple devices for the same implant volume. This enables the monitoring of a wider interfacing area of the nervous system while providing a multidirectional intervention tool. Our ideas and intellectual property have been published and protected throughout the technology development. We have three published patents related to the proposed implants. Two of them are already granted in the UK and various other countries. We have secured a collaboration with Newcastle University to validate our prototypes and to run experiments in animal models in a safe and controlled environment. Moreover, we have established a partnership with one of the UK's leading groups in epilepsy research at King's College London. This will allow us to run a first-in-human clinical trial, monitoring the neural activity of patients suffering from drug-resistant epilepsy and who are already undergoing surgery. We have novel technology and IP. We have a first clinical target. And now we have a plan to translate our innovation into a clinical solution and a viable business. But we don't want to stop there. Our long-term vision is to expand the medical applications our technologies can target, tackling other important health conditions such as dementia and stroke, which are the next pandemic for our aging society. There is a long and exciting road ahead. So we're looking for collaborators and partners to join us on our mission to provide solutions for improving patients' quality of life. Hi, uh, thanks in advance for your attention. I'm Dr. Claire Higgins. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Bioengineering at Imperial College London, and I'm going to talk to you today about IP that's come out of my laboratory relating to a therapeutic that both accelerates wound closure and reduces scarring. Now, unlike lower vertebrates, humans are susceptible to scarring. Any type of injury will result in a scar, um, whether it's an internal or an external injury. Um, all injuries to humans repair through fibrotic mechanisms as opposed to regenerative mechanisms, and as such, they as such they all result in formation of scar tissue. Now, the resultant scar has limited functionality, but perhaps more critically, it's also prone to re-injury. For example, 30% of pressure sores occur on sites where pressure sores were in the 12 months prior to the skin being injured again. And this matters because all individuals at some point in their life will have an injury to their skin. And this may be as a result of external factors that are out of their control, for example, an incision um, from a surgeon or a burn. But some injuries occur in response to a combination of both internal and external factors, for example, ulcers or skin tears. And this means that some cohorts or individuals are more susceptible than others. For example, skin age is an intrinsic factor that affects injury susceptibility. And we see 88% of skin tears occurring in individuals who are over the age of 65, while pressure ulcers are five times more likely to occur in an 80-year-old compared to someone 15 years younger. Now, the only product that is on the market and approved by the FDA, and I should add not approved by the EMA because it was withdrawn, is Regranix, uh, which has PDGF as its active ingredient and is used to accelerate closure of chronic wounds such as diabetic ulcer 
ulcers. Now, it's not suitable for pressure ulcers, nor is there any FDA or EMA approved product for injuries such as these. Now, if we look at reduction of scarring, um, as of May last year, there have been 181 clinical trials conducted uh, to identify therapeutics that reduce scarring. However, no biologic product that reduces scar formation after wound closure has ever been approved by either the EMA or the FDA. And so in my lab, we took inspiration from the fact that hairy skin, uh, so skin on the scalp, heals faster and with less scarring than uh, non-hairy skin or skin on the body. And we uh, took inspiration from this and identified two cytokines that are released from the hair follicle and can accelerate wound closure and reduce scar formation. And we use various uh, human skin wound closure models to evaluate these two cytokines. And we found that not only did they significantly accelerate skin reepithelialization, um, otherwise known as wound closure, but that they also outperformed PDGF, which I remind you is the active ingredient in Regranix. And this outperformance of PDGF was both in terms of reepithelialization and growth capacity. And we also evaluated uh, dermal architecture after wound closure, and we found that less collagen was deposited um, after treatment with these two cytokines, indicative of a reduction in scar formation. And so I hope you can appreciate how our technology can both accelerate wound closure after injury and prevent scar tissue formation, which will decrease the likelihood of re-injury. So with a number of people over the age of 60 expected to have doubled by between now and 2050, um, the burden of skin aging on healthcare systems is predicted to exponentially increase. And so any therapeutic that both accelerates healing and makes skin stronger uh, will be essential to maintain our general health as we age. So thank you for listening and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mengzing, Dorian and Claire for the great contributions. I hope you all enjoyed it. I'm Marika and I'm part of the industry partnerships and commercialization team at Imperial, supporting academics to commercialize the technologies developed by a licensing or startup formation. If you're interested to know how to engage with Imperial and get access to our technologies, please get in touch after the event and visit imperial.tech, our platform showcasing Imperial's technologies available for licensing. We would be happy to discuss with you what we do and the support we provide for new partnership and commercialization opportunities. Contact details are in the event page and also in the chat. It is now time for the Q&A and I shall leave the floor to Dr. Jonathan Jeffers. Well, thank you to all the speakers. That was a great um, overview of some of the healthcare technology that we're working on at Imperial. Please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen um, to ask questions. There's already a whole bunch coming up. Um, I'm going to jump straight into these. And the first one I'm going to ask is for you, Mengzing. Um, there's two questions here. They're both more or less the same. Um, with your technology, what types of uh, cancers could be detected earlier through routine assessment and so on compared to the current state of the art? So, uh, I mean, ultrasound is very good with a, a, a wide range of organs. Uh, I think the only part that currently there's still um, uh, some difficulty is, is like you have lots of air, like lung, or, or you have the brain where you have bone. Otherwise, the soft tissue, the parts, those are all kind of uh, achievable by ultrasound. And uh, uh, I think another question about whether you could do this, I mean, in, outside the hospital environment, I think definitely that's the direction to go. Ultrasound is totally accessible and portable and could potentially be used uh, uh, at uh, the point of care. So in addition, it, to, in addition to your um, the machine, so ultrasound is everywhere, are you going to have to supply additional software or uh, image processing cards or something to plug into the back of the machine? Um, what extra cost would be involved in your in your technology? Right. So yeah, I mean, there there's definitely we have uh, some extra uh, software. So basically, the signal processing, post processing, that's what we uh, the, the the key part of that. We do uh, depending on the application, we do have a little bit hardware to plug in, but they're, they're really at 
um, I don't have a figure on top of the top of my head to give you, but they are comparing to the cost of the ultrasound system, they are relatively minor. Great. Yeah, thank you. F fascinating technology to see the flow images was, was really, really good. Um, we have a couple of questions here for Claire. Um, so Claire, um, the question here is, does your skin technology work for pressure ulcers? And there's a similar question, which you can answer at the same time. Um, does it apply to any type of wound? So very similar questions. Um, so we've only looked at re-epithelialization. We haven't looked at preventing pressure ulcers or preventing any sort of injury. Um, and in terms of wound closure, we've looked at um, punch wounds or acute wounds. We haven't looked at chronic wounds or infected wounds yet. And um, I think your early data looks amazing. Um, do you see any barriers in scaling this up to from lab tests to at scale production? Do you think is there anything fundamental in your in your growth factors that could put a barrier in the way to making it at scale? Um, not that I'm aware of, and there's quite well established um, pipelines. And in terms of safety, when we were um, when we got the review from the patent attorneys, um, they pulled up the fact that our cytokine had been used as a treatment for cancer. Um, so actually, that was, I mean, it was encouraging. It's not related to wound healing, but it was encouraging that it was being used in other purposes and it looks safe. Yes, yeah, so so I don't really a, see any hurdles. From a regulatory point of view as well, a repurposing type thing like you're, you're mentioning is, is, a, is very positive as well, I think. That's very nice. Um, there's a question here for uh, Dario. Um, Dario, your idea of using a sleeve to do the brain function, the measuring rather than invasive approach was fascinating. Um, could you tell us what your accuracy in detection is at the moment? And will it be possible to be 100% accurate for any individuals? I presume that's relative to the current invasive uh, method. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, with our technique, we record uh, from the body surface and at the moment we decode the activity of spinal cord circuits, not the brain, although we are extending this technique also for, um, uh, for the brain. At the spinal cord level, uh, we have um, uh, now developed algorithms that are uh, uh, close to 100% accurate uh, for, uh, for, uh, for all individuals. We have tested them uh, in a number of patients, in tremor patients, in stroke, in spinal cord injury, um, and in a number of other conditions. Uh, and we are driving neurotechnologies with these algorithms uh, with um, almost perfect accuracy. So one thing I thought, the, the, the idea of not having to do surgery is very compelling and clearly massively cost saving, but you're turning this technology into a wearable, um, indicating it's going to get very well, cheap, certainly compared to surgery, but just how cheap? Is this the kind of thing that people will be able to, you know, buy in a chemist? How, how cheap can this get, would you say? Yeah. It can be um, extremely cheap. It can really be um, at the level of um, uh, smart devices or smart watches that we uh, we wear uh, with um, embedded electrodes. So we are working with Facebook, for example, in this direction, uh, not for medical application, but for larger consumer electronics. Um, and uh, this would definitely be um, at the level of cost uh, that could be, um, could be spread even for consumer electronics applications. So uh, extremely cheap. A comment, uh, I mean, if we think of the big revolutions uh, in, uh, in medicine, one of them is certainly non-invasive medical imaging. And non-invasive medical imaging is one of the technologies that have revolutionized medicine uh, in the past decades. This is um, MRI and a number of other concepts. What we lack uh, is an electrical uh, interface, an electrical imaging, which would mean that to detect electrical activity of neurons, single neurons, uh, non-invasively. And I believe that will be the next, uh, the next revolution. If we are able to detect electrical activity of neurons non-invasively for all the main neural structures in the human body, that would certainly be a revolution. The cost would be, uh, as you say, dramatically inferior to any other type of, uh, uh, of technology. Thank you, Dario. 
Um, let's talk about the uh, distributed network array in the brain, which was Dorian's talk. Um, you have a question here. Um, how long will these neural implants last? Will they stay there in the short term? Are they excreted? What happens to them once you put them in? Yeah, I mean, the uh, first of all, thanks for, for the question. Um, I think there are, there's a short answer and a long answer. So the short answer is that we're aiming to have uh, a lifetime device that is implanted and stays uh, with, with the patient for, for their whole life. Um, and the long answer is that we need to do that, we need to make our technology biocompatible and, and, um, and this is essentially implantable technologies. And, and there are two aspects into this. So on one side, the device doesn't have to harm the body and the body doesn't have to harm the device. And so for this reason, we're using um, technology and, and silicon chip technology to make also the, the, the package hermetic. So we're using certain type of technology to make it, uh, to encapsulate similar to uh, what current technologies that are based on, on bulky implantable and uh, metallic cases are. And so uh, these are moisture proof. And so we want to make the package that doesn't allow water to get into it, to damage the, the technology. And, and to do this, we have been working on accelerated lifetime testing um, and, and to prove that it, this could last for and be stable for decades. Uh, we don't use any toxic materials, so we use we use only by compatible materials. Also, um, in the in the uh, electronic device itself, and um, yeah, so I think that's that's okay. Main. Uh, what, what, with the current devices where you you put in a, a single device, okay, you don't have the array of the spread like you get. Yes. But it is one device. Um, whereas you're putting in tens or maybe even hundreds of of devices into the brain. Um, does that come at an increased cost um, to the healthcare provider because you have to supply hundreds of these things rather than just one? Um, I guess that um, to to understand the whole uh, the cost, uh, I think we need to kind of like zoom out and see the cost of the whole healthcare and uh, the healthcare economics of the technology, not just the device itself. So um, we have seen that pharmaceuticals have the cost of pharmaceuticals has increased in the past decades. And, and also uh, implantable technologies have shown that the cost can go down and then and you can make affordable solutions. And, and we have pioneered this uh, chip scale technology, chip scale implantable technology uh, with our knowledge in, in microelectronics and, and medical devices. And, and with that, then we're using, we're kind of like um, taking advantage of two core functions, which are on one side, we're using microchip technology, which we have everywhere in our phones, and that is becoming cheaper and cheaper. So that, that will reduce the cost. And on the other side, as I said earlier, we're making it biocompatible wireless. And, uh, and, and we're making it very small to reduce the cost of surgery uh, as well. And so it's not about how many devices, but it, it's about the service that we, we, we want to provide. I see, that's quite clear. Thank you for, for that. Um, we'll move on because we have other unanswered questions here. Um, this one's for Richard. Um, there's uh, oh, it's, the question then has moved. Um, what can what can your work do, the orthopedic work that you do, relative to osteoporosis? So you you talked about all the lovely lab methods that you have for testing um, orthopedic implants, but um, osteoporosis is a is an aging thing. And can your type of techniques that you presented can they address that as well? Uh, yes, yes, in a number of ways. Um, the osteoporosis disease will affect bone fundamentally. And the way you design a metal implant for someone who has normal bone has to be different to the way you design an implant for someone who has osteoporosis. And so you can study osteoporotic bone in the lab. You can understand how it behaves. You can understand how it's similar, how it's different. And then you can start to target treatments for people who have more normal bone, or people who have osteopenia, or people who have osteoporosis. And you can tune the properties of your implants. And that's, it's recent tech innovations, such as that additive manufacturing that allow you to do that. Uh, then we can study that in the lab with bone. We can even get the bone to adapt to the implants in the lab. So now you're saying, will it heal around the implant? And how are we mechanically stimulating these different types of bone that have very different challenges? And there's some really, awesome work going to link length scales in the group where you can go from tissue level right down through the collagen to a nano scale where you can see how does osteoporosis affect bone at the tiniest length scale we can image with synchrotron level x-rays and scale that all the way back up to 
a treatment that can go into a patient and we can get a surgeon in the lab to try that treatment and preclinically test it and say, is that going to make a difference? And that's just exciting. Uh, and it's, it's really a lot of fun to do. Thanks, Richard. That's a very nice um, demonstration of the technology. Let's move, switch to the personalized medicine. Uh, Cleo, we've got a couple of questions here for you. Um, could you, uh, one is the cost of it. So um, the, the personalization you talked about, um, the, um, the uh, protein-based therapies, or the, sorry, the protein-based uh, therapies and the cell-free platforms that you had look really promising. Is there a, you, you can be much quicker than current uh, vaccine um, uh, generation, which in today's world is brilliant. Um, are you going to be more expensive? So if we compare at a large scale, then it is indeed more expensive. But if we look at uh, what the cell-based technologies that would be necessary to deliver small quantities would be, then the cost is in fact comparable. Um, so if we are looking at a small cohort of patients, then it is comparable. This is only on a mass basis. So if we just look at production output, but what we are now testing is the efficacy of those personalized medicines. So what we are hoping to be able to show in the near future is that in fact, these products are highly efficacious. And so we would need less of them. So once we factor that into the equation, we would think that the cost would be comparable to mass production of non-personalized medicines. Okay, and um, there's a follow on question from that, which I'm going to ask to Cleo, and then perhaps anyone else can jump in if they want. But the, it's about uh, personalized treatment. So it applies to everybody's technology here, personalized treatment. Uh, but for Chloe, um, first of all, are there studies in being tools being developed for um, other aspects of uh, personalized medicine, like uh, supplementation and nutrition? You might be able to speak to that. And then um, for everybody, um, uh, the personalized uh, medicine cost aspect. Chloe's already talked about that, but that's for everybody else. So Chloe, could you answer the one about personalized supplementation and nutrition first? So there is research within Imperial, not within our laboratory, but uh, in the laboratory of collaborators within life sciences and medicine that looks at the gut microbiome and also the gut glycobiome. And these are both intricately linked to immune system function. So there is uh, quite a lot on the characterization. Uh, and also we are now doing uh, some machine learning work to be able to come up with uh, patterns that can guide uh, GPs in making decisions about supplementation. So does anyone else have a comment to add on personalization? Um, it's also for the panel, if you want to say something on personalization, also um, aging prevention. Um, so what preventative technologies are we all working on? I'm going to pick on someone if they don't volunteer. So I'm going to pick on Richard. Aging prevention. What type of surgery can we do to prevent aging of the musculoskeletal system? Um, there's, a, a, it, there's a lot you can do in terms of maintaining that mobility before it degrades. So one of the most common end stage diseases would be osteoarthritis. And it's quite often linked to a, a mechanical deformity that progresses over time. So if you can correct the mechanical deformity, so it could be a joint alignment, it could be removing a bit of bone that's impinging, and you can do that in someone who's 30, you can get rid of the mechanical environment that's causing the joint to degrade, you can preserve the joint, and they'll never need the end stage treatment to treat the disease because the disease is never going to form. And there's a lot of really exciting technologies to enable things like tibial osteotomies, treatments for impingement in the hip. Uh, and that's really the scope. There's, it doesn't even to the point where the, da the damage is done. You could intervene before it takes hold uh, and prevent the disease pathways leading to end stage disease. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to uh, ask Maxine the next question, which is the same about preventative aging, or in your case, preventative cancer, is what you were talking about. Um, how do you see your technology preventing the reoccurrence of cancer through uh, monitoring? Yes, so, so really because the technology is um, with high resolution and sense, uh, high sensitivity, so basically it can pick up, potentially can pick up very, very early signs of the disease. And that will give us opportunity to, to have early uh, intervention. 
So I think that's where the ultrasound, the, uh, the kind of the high resolution imaging come in here. Um, maybe I can extend that type of question to Claire as well. So um, is it possible to do a preventative thing where you know a scar is going to occur and you can apply growth factors, uh, you know, before the, the, as before the scarring tissue has a chance to heal as part of wound healing uh, bandages and things like that? Is that part of your um, yeah, it's one of the things we're interested in. Um, scar tissue is obviously weaker, so it is more prone to re-injury. And um, we we haven't done mechanical testing yet, but we do know that uh, the collagen that is deposited in the wound after treatment with our growth factors is slightly different than scar tissue collagen. And we're gonna now look and see if that actually makes the skin stronger, which would prevent it from re-injury. Um, also on that point, we obviously know that um, aged individuals are more susceptible to injury. And we know that it's the thickness of the skin uh, which decreases with age, which leads to increased incidence of blisters and tearing. And it's the composition of the skin that leads to an increase in incidence of pressure sores. And so we don't, we know how we age, we don't know why the skin ages, um, but we at least have targets to um, kind of look at to prevent different types of injuries. And we can look at how our cytokines can modulate things like skin thickness and skin composition. Thank you, Claire. There's um, another question has popped up that I think is for Dario. Um, can your uh, communication support technology be applied to children? Um, if, for example, with disabilities, or is it only for the um, fully mature adult? It is a, a nice question to answer because uh, just a few months ago, we have published um, a nice paper showing this technology applied to infants. So to, to babies um, a few weeks old, uh, just to show that we can actually monitor the <laughs> spinal cord output uh, uh, even in very small children. In that case, it was the first time in which uh, we mapped the activity of spinal motor neurons uh, in, uh, in uh, babies a few weeks old during uh, uh, natural movements. So uh, that's an example of application where uh, surgery would not be uh, possible. But in general, in children with, um, with diseases, this is certainly a, an area of application, for example, in cerebral palsy for early diagnosis or for uh, monitoring uh, or even for driving uh, assistive technology. So uh, the young, young children is certainly one of the big areas of application of this technology. Thank you, Dario. Um, another question has popped up for Dorian. Um, the microchips that you put in, what is your um, security uh, challenge to prevent un unauthorized people accessing this array? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. And I think it falls also into the ethical issues of, of this type of technologies. But in our case, our um, wireless technology is, is implanted and we have um, an external device that then will read the, the signals from inside, similar to what cochlear, and cochlear implants do. Um, however, everything is encrypted. So we have encryption in, in the communication and the communication happens only between the uh, wearable device that is on, on the head and, and the uh, inside data, which I said is, is already encrypted and, and so non-interpretable. And if for someone to hack that type of um, signal, uh, they would need to get actually into the skin, under the skin to get to that, uh, that, um, that the data that signal. And also the, the, the processing itself happens in the outs outside in the wearable device. And, uh, and also, and so after the processing, only the desired output is sent then to an external device. And so also in that case, it's very difficult for someone to hack and interpret that output data uh, from, from the wearable device. Okay, thank you, Dorian. Um, there's still two questions in the chat bar. Uh, the first one is about asking to share technology with um, cognitive function and mental health issues. Um, the IPC team have seen that question. And uh, this is something that um, they're going to, you can connect with the IPC team using the communica communication addresses that you have. Do raise it for them if you want to see talks uh, regarding mental health and things. We do have that work at Imperial and we can um, pre prepare that at, at a follow-on event. Um, the final question is from Jeff Reed, and it's asking about the upcoming students uh, coming into this high-tech world. The answer is yes. 
So um, what I'd like all the panelists to do is just put your hand up if you have um, students working on the projects that you've just described. So if you have, put your hand up. So, you know, everybody on the call, everyone who's spoken to you today is training students in these high tech fields. That's part of our job as well as being academics is to train the next generation of um, people into this field from the undergraduate level through to the postdocs. Um, and I'm very pleased to say as well, at Imperial, quite a high percentage of our spin outs that are formed from Imperial come from the undergraduate population. So it's something that Rebecca and her team are very keen to promote and it's, and it's working well, giving the high volume of spin outs from undergraduates. Um, I think we're coming to the end of our time now. We have answered uh, all the questions in the Q&A. Um, it just falls for me to thank the speakers very much um, for their, uh, their contributions and answering all the questions. Um, it's been a really good event. And I think there's one more uh, talk is going to happen now and a short survey, and that will draw the event to a close. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks very much for all the speakers for their contribution to this event. I'm Julia Zangheri uh, from the Imperial Business Partners Programme, the College Corporate Membership Programme. And on behalf of the Enterprise Division, I'd like to thank all the attendees for their time and their engaged questions during the, the Q&A session. Please do reach out to us through the links that you have in the chat and the email that you will receive in the coming days to discuss further collaboration opportunities and how we can connect you with the college research and innovation. Once again, thanks again. There will be a poll coming up very shortly just for us to gather your feedback on the session and get always better at doing these activities. Again, thank you for your time and have a lovely day.